You know what? One thing I've got to say, and you guys can correct me or not, but yeah, you know, I think I think it broke your dad's heart to retire, even though oh, he yeah. kind of wanted to, yeah. and he kind of didn't want to. Yeah, you know. no, that that job was his. I mean, he that loved that right. job. Loved, loved oh, yeah. television, loved filming, loved yeah. the news. It, well, that's all he talked about. He oh, yeah. yeah. retired. Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. This is your dad, Terry and Cherry, in the last part of 1942 after I was in the Marine Corps for a short time before I went overseas into combat. The first objective of Admiral Nimitz's island-hopping armadas, Tarawa Atoll, had become a Japanese fortress from whose airstrip planes could strike at the U.S. fleet. Tarawa had to be taken. This was D-Day, the day that we landed against the enemy under very heavy fire. We lost over a thousand men the first day. I was in one of these Higgins boats at the time that these pictures were being taken. He did an outstanding job in the Marines. He was re he made seven landings under fire, getting off the ship and going into the water and swimming, you know, with all of his equipment. And he said people were just dying all around him, you know, they were being shot. And he had put himself through technical training, well, in the war. Okay, mm -hmm. and he would get his correspondence lessons in the army, and then he'd do them. Marines. Or the Marines, I'm sorry. And he would do them uh, when he was out in the field, um, and then he'd send them back in. So he was he was earning his degree in electronics and communications while he was at war. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I remember him saying he'd be sitting in a foxhole and be doing the you know his lessons. I went to school in television. And I became a cameraman on the Betty White and Al Jarvis show. We were asked to bring the twins on the show. They're on television here right now. It's Sherry on the left, Terry on the right. Growing up, I know Sherry and I have some good memories yeah. of Grandpa. Mm -hmm. And uh, just strange growing up with a cameraman for your dad. Yeah, he um, would come home with all the outtakes. Oops from the news. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Always had all the good stories, the big stories. He was always the first to go. They'd always call him and uh, we, we went on some stuff with him. We'd do right. the fires and uh, yeah. go up with them. The yeah. Mm -hmm. I went over to Channel 7 one day. I got a call and they said we have a problem over here. Our guy is off sick. So I said, well, I'm not working today. I'll come over and help out. Now, to my surprise, when I got over there and helped out, uh, uh, I met Errol Stevens, who was a very nice guy, a uh, very nice fellow to meet. He was very friendly. He knew what he was doing. Uh, he was a good cameraman, good technician. And uh, I got along very well with Earl. I, I was very happy with Earl. This is a magazine article that um, they did on me when I was operating television and film. This is an award that I received from the Los Angeles City Council for shooting a documentary on the police academy. I was in my kitchen, I answered the phone. And, Greg, and Earl would call, call me in the morning and ask me if I wanted to go with him that day because he'd be shooting stories. And so I said, yeah, I, I don't know. I said, what are you going to be doing? And he said, oh, I'm going to be interviewing a guy named John Revolta. <laughs> John Travolta? Yeah. And so when I said John Revolta, I hadn't understood. I'd never heard of him. He was just you knew on the scene. So when Suzanne heard that, she said, oh, that's John Travolta. I want to go. I want to go. Earl figured out that television news was here to stay and that he could make some improvements on these cameras. Well, this, is, uh, this, is, this was the big evolution of the news business at this point because Earl, for the next 10 years, basically worked on improving that camera. Uh, he went to the engineers around town. He went to the... Uh, camera people around town. He said, this is what I need. I need 
I need a lightweight portable camera, something that one man can carry, something that has sound on it and pictures, something that I can take, put it on television, that, that we can show the people what we're doing. A guy by the name of Ed DiGiulio took over Cinema Products. And Cinema Products, uh, you may have heard them, they invented the Steadicam. Ed DiGiulio used to talk, come over and talk to Earl at Channel 7 and ask Earl what he would like in a camera. And Earl would say, well, I need a camera that's portable. I need a camera that's operated with lightweight batteries. I need a camera that has a zoom lens so I can zoom in without walking. And I need a camera that has sound. And Ed DiGiulio would come back with his package of prototype and say, Earl, is this what we need? And Earl would say, no. I like this, but I, don't, I need a magazine that can pop off. And I have to have the balance on my shoulder. And what they did was develop this camera to the place it was the most lightweight, portable news camera in the, in the world. And Ed DiGiulio sold many of these cameras around the world. So it's, now this camera is basically the first generation of the final camera that Earl Stevens worked with to, to, to design. You can see through the viewfinder. With the right hand you hold it, one hand. And then with the left hand, you can adjust the focus, you can adjust the f-stop, and also you can adjust the zoom. You can control the zoom. So with one hand, you can hold a camera and photograph somebody, take a picture, and get sound at the same time. This, is, this was an astounding feat. What he did, he practiced what he preached. He would take the camera out and try it, and he would use it. He was just very innovative, very creative. So, so uh, Earl Stevens basically is, uh, is, is probably uh, the father of the camcorder and, and probably the uh, father of, uh, of uh, television news as it is today. Uh, this is a rescue that we had to go on. Uh, they found the body in the canyon. The uh, lower extremities of the body up to mid-stomach uh, area and the head uh, and uh, shoulders are submerged. We cannot see them and as you can see here we are attempting to remove water and dig at the same time. It's really very difficult. But there were times when it, you could see where it really bothered him too. Um, when it was things with children, small children or mm -hmm. something, that, that was that one thing hard. he could not, could not handle. That terrible, like, poor little thing. And if, uh, you know, a story would break in the middle of the night, he'd get the call and he'd either have to go out on it or get somebody else. And if they were shorthanded for, um, you know, a sound man or a reporter or something, that was his job to, to get the people out there. Why do you do it? Why do you do the stunts like that? It is exciting, I'll tell you. Television news is not like the motion picture industry. The motion picture industry is scripted. Television news has no script. When you set your camera up or have your camera running, you get one chance. That camera's running and you get it the first time. There isn't any take two. There isn't any take three. And this is where Earl um, showed up to be uh, superior. Earl Stevens was an unbelievable cameraman. This guy could throw a camera on his shoulder, turn that camera, he knew when to turn the camera on. He knew when to turn it off. His film was su just superior in quality than anybody else's. His exposure was always good. I can never remember him uh, dumping any film like others have done. He was always able to get his story. And if the story wasn't there, he could even piece it together to make it interesting so that it made the air. And not only that, he was able to go out and shoot. I watched him one time in an eight hour day. He shot seven stories. He went through and did seven television news stories within that eight hour period. I mean, they were like that. Because he knew he could quickly load the camera film. He knew the batteries were always charged properly. See, there's a million things you have to do when, when you're, when you're uh, doing television news. This vast ocean of air and clouds all around us. I had an apprentice uh, shooting the stuff on the ground and I uh, shot the stuff in the air. You know, he never really was very proud. He just was so humble. 
His humility was just outstanding. He just never wanted credit for anything, but people were always giving him credit because they knew he was the one that knew how to do things. If it hurt his feelings, he never would let it be known. He never complained or grumbled about anything. He continued doing the same things, helping people when they needed it without any regard for what credit he would get. He was just an inspiration to be with. He was always so trusted by everybody. If Earl would, was on the scene of a fire, he would be apt to put his camera down and start, pick up a hose and start putting the fire out. Because that, he, had, he was so compassionate to people that he thought that was more important than, you know, than taking a picture of it. Grandpa was also a fan of Jacques Cousteau. Well, he knew Jacques Cousteau, didn't he? And, yeah, he well, did, he, did, he did a lot of stories or some stories some dives with and him. Yeah. And stuff. He loved it. He loved the ocean, the water. Yeah. Yeah. The uh, main cabin of the Calypso, uh, Jacques Gasteau's Calypso, and uh, that's George Arnold on the left, myself, and Bob Page, the reporter. This is 1967. Uh, this is me uh, getting in my scuba gear. We went out and did some uh, rescue. This is the underwater uh, stuff that I shot, working with the Coast Guard. And uh, we were off the coast of uh, Catalina near the Isthmus. I went down and they simulated a belly breathing uh, procedure. We simulated a rescue here to emphasize the dangers of uh, diving without proper certification and proper instruction. The television viewers of Southern California were probably the biggest benefactors of Earl Stevens. They got to see things that possibly before he was a cameraman, nobody could have shown. It was only his, his camera ability and his innovations in building this lightweight, fast camera, news camera, that allowed this to happen. He set the stage for television news as it is today. This guy was a genius. He was the smartest person I've ever known. There's no telling what he could have done if he'd continued to live. He died far too soon because he had so much yet to give. all the time. Yeah. Right now, probably. Yeah. <laughs> laughing at us, going, oh no, don't say that. Yeah. Don't say that. <laughs> oh no, they said that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Why are they saying that in front of, every, in front of the world? Because it's about time. Yeah. It's about time that he gets the recognition that he, credit for all yeah. he did not want all that time. He did it just for the love of the business. And, uh, and he was wanting to be behind the camera. Not yeah, behind the action. Did not yeah. want any center stage. No, he just uh, wanted to be behind the line, so. Mm -hmm.